All right. So we don't run uh, over time. Uh, thank you all for showing up today um, for the second AI and healthcare rounds. We're very lucky to have uh, Mehdi Marathi presenting his work today. So uh, Mehdi did a PhD at Queens in computing in 2008, and then he did uh, postdoctoral fellowships at UBC and Harvard Medical School. And in all these institutions, he spent a lot of his time working with clinicians in hospital settings. Um, Mehdi has a decade or so of experience working at IBM Research and Google as a uh, research data scientist with a focus on machine learning for healthcare and business applications. Uh, he led the machine learning side of an effort on developing the first IBM products in, image, in imaging with AI-driven features, and he received two corporate technical achievement awards for these efforts. Uh, one for work on automatic reading of chest x-rays, which coincidentally is the topic of today's talk. Uh, on the academic side of his career, he has been a longtime member of the medical image computing community and has been a co-author of papers winning best paper awards at Mackay twice. Um, moreover, he has been awarded 20 U.S. patents uh, for his inventions. And we are lucky to have him. He recently joined McMaster as an associate professor in the Department of Computing and Software. Uh, so with that intro, Mehdi, take it away. Thank you very much, John. Um, very uh, glad to be here. And thanks for taking time out of your day to attend this. I know it's and like uh, almost end of August. Uh, I hope everyone is having uh, a little bit of last bit of fun in the summer um, while uh, we prepare to go back to classes and everything on the campus. Um, one little bit of uh, um, disclosure that I have to give, as was mentioned, I have worked at uh, different corporations at IBM Research and uh, Google. I still have that uh, relationship. And uh, but the material that I will present here is academic work, and what is from IBM Research is all in public domain. None of this material is the opinion of the company or its executives. So with that uh, out of the way, today I'm going to talk about uh, mostly chess X-rays and how to how how I see the field of AI is moving in uh, the area of radiology. It's not a general radiology AI talk. It's a lot of it is focused on chest X-ray and part of the conversation is going to be about why chest X-ray specifically. So we'll, we'll get to that. Um, before that, I tend to start my conversations with this. Um, so before we get to AI and uh, before we get to healthcare, let's talk, talk a little bit about AI itself. Um, uh, these days, you see, you hear a lot about uh, things like Chat GPT and Bard, and uh, AI has moved from uh, the academic domain to really consumer domain. I throughout the talk, I talk about this um, non healthcare kind of AI as consumer AI, um, not a standard term. So I want to cl clarify that at the beginning. So. In uh, the, the term itself was coined in, uh, in the 50s, and there was uh, when perceptron, which is essentially the building block of neural networks, was introduced in um, at that time. There was a lot of excitement around it, and there was a period of, of uh, active research that first up upward uh, trajectory here. And, uh, but in pretty quickly, it was realized that this, the first version of these perceptrons was kind of incapable of solving some basic questions with nonlinearity. And then that caused this first level of uh, what we call winter of AI, which was a, a period of lack of investment in academic research. Uh, during that same time or shortly after, with the invention of backpropagation, we learned how to train multiple layers of these perceptrons suddenly the interest picked up because we started solving more complicated problems with AI. Um, but uh, there was another round of uh, winter essentially for AI in uh, late 90s and early 2000s when um, it seemed like we had peaked. It seemed like even though there was a lot of hype in the 80s, it's, uh, we really 
got to the point where it seemed like we can only solve uh, problems that are very well defined. We can't really get into anything creative with AI. And um, it essentially is good just for uh, mundane tasks. But, uh, and, and I, I actually started my PhD uh, early 2000s. Um, in 2004, I wrote a paper as part of a course project on using neural networks, which at the time we called just neural networks. And the deep part of it was not there yet to solve the problem of intrusion detection in, in, in a network attack. So if you have a denial of access to a service, you look at the pattern of the traffic and before it happens, actually, you can catch it using my network. I wrote that as a course project. I didn't think about it much and wasn't really noticed as much. And then a few years later, I noticed before I finished my PhD, which was on medical imaging, not on that topic, I noticed that that paper is getting a lot of citations suddenly years later. And um, it's now one of my most cited papers because essentially right after that, there was this interest in uh, deep learning that picked up. Um, and when, um, uh, when uh, in 2012, as part of CVPR, the conference, computer vision conference, um, essentially, deep neural convolutional neural networks managed to change the benchmarks of computer vision significantly, and that kind of opened the floodgate of funding and uh, interest. And then you have this upward tra trajectory that has not stopped. So it doesn't look like we are going into another winter. Um, if there is a worry, it's about where we are going with this. Not about like cooling down. It, essentially, we are more worried about the consequences and unexpected outcomes of this. But in all areas from, in all areas, this has uh, been successful, especially like the, of interest to us is for example, AlphaGo, which is in healthcare. But most of these, as you see, are what we call, uh, sorry, AlphaFold, which is in healthcare. AlphaGo, uh, essentially the ability of reinforcement learning in a game. Um, and uh, then in 2017, I want to highlight with the introduction of transformers, we had another leap. Uh, essentially, as of that time, you don't really need to, uh, in consumer domain, if you have giant amounts of data, you don't really need a lot of effort in labeling. And that really created an effort, uh, a huge success story, especially with generative AI, and that directly um, is uh, what has brought us things like chat GPT and Dali in the imaging side. So this, um, this is kind of like the consumer AI uh, trend of the last, I don't know, 60 years. And we are at the top of that bit and a lot of excitement there. Now, what about in, uh, before I go any further, as we talked with John about this, if there are questions, um, I don't see hands because I'm looking at the screen, but don't uh, necessarily wait to the end. I'm happy to have a discussion here. That is the tradition of this forum and we wanna keep it. So if there are questions, stop us and ask. Unfortunately, I don't see the, the hands, but I think John is monitoring that. Um, so what about in healthcare? In healthcare, there are a lot of applications where you have tasks that are repeated and they, they tend to be good candidates for AI. Um, even the older versions of AI. Uh, this is one of them. Uh, radiologists look at a lot of uh, medical images in dark rooms and a significant portion of their time essentially is spent on that. And if we could find ways to um, bring their attention to the right area or read the, uh, the image for them, um, they would have more time to actually spend on interacting with the patient and uh, on, the, on, on, the, on tasks that are essentially out of the reach of AI. Uh, but uh, there are challenges that are unique to medical imaging, specifically when we come to uh, AI. I want to let it, like, highlight some of these a bit. Those, let's remind ourselves what kind of like created this huge advance in the field of machine learning in areas such as vision and image classification in the last 10 years. There are three things really. One, this increased uh, computational power that we started to have. GPUs, uh, graphical processing units became uh, available. They are capable of implementing huge matrix operations in real time and allow us to do 
um, back propagation on networks that are hundreds of layers deep and billions of parameters. And that, that is one part of it. The other part is there is data to do that. There's huge amounts of data. If you look at uh, language models that are changing the world today, essentially they have the whole World Wide Web to train on which has caused this issue of like, we have when you have so much data, are you pooling data that you don't have IP for and things like that. But from the technical point of view, uh, essentially the world, the, the sky is the limit. You have pretty much unlimited data to train a language model these days. And with the transformers and self-supervision that has become the norm since around 2017, you don't even need to label these. So essentially you just need a whole lot of computational power and data that you have. So it becomes expensive to train because there's a lot of like, uh, some, some of these models have been trained on huge amounts of data over months, but it takes out the, 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 the training, uh, sorry, the, the labeling needs and the data is available. Now, the same reasons why uh, consumer AI has had so much success, let's look at them in the context of our application of imaging. The data sets in medical imaging are often is small and silo. Um, this is partly because privacy and regulatory issues and partly because essentially we haven't put the effort into bringing them together and making them large and accessible. And <clears throat> especially when it comes to rare disease, rare conditions, there is very few samples in many of these small data sets that, we are, that people are working on. Uh, one solution to this is transfer learning, trying to kind of transfer some of the um, capabilities of consumer AI into our field, which we do, but um, they are, it's not sufficient really because we can't really train um, specialized networks very well. Um, because of the size of these data sets, um, some of these um, transformer-based methods and self-supervision um, uh, become essentially problematic because they rely on a lot of data as well. So that's another problem that we have. Um, so let's annotate and do uh, supervised learning where there you, you have the cost of annotation. Um, there's also data domain adaptability because most of these data sets are in focus in one institution or if you are very lucky in one country, and uh, they, they don't have the right distribution of all races and all ages that you need in medical imaging. And um, a model trained in one effort is often not good when you take it and use it on a different data set. You also, in medical imaging, we have 3D modalities. 3D modalities essentially uh, bring in a, uh, an exponential complication of the size of the networks because you are looking at 3D, you're looking at voxels as opposed to pixels. And last but not least, we need we have the need to explain uh, the need for explainability. Essentially, it doesn't matter what you build; you have to go through FDA. So that makes some of the problems that we are dealing with with language models these days are uh, become kind of magnified to a huge uh, extent when you're dealing with healthcare because um, uh, obviously. You need to have the ability to explain your the, the working of your model and have the right validation. With all of these, um, I want to talk some about some of the things that people have done to address these, and mostly in the context of chest X-ray. So the success story here. So I told you like the the the, the uh, problems, but mostly we are going to talk about the good stuff. What do we do to solve this? Uh, there, there is a bright spot in this area of medical imaging, I would say, and that's in the area of chest X-ray images. And the reason is that I've, you see on the right on this slide, I have the three that I think are the biggest public data sets. And uh, the, the top one, chest X-ray 8, came out, I think, end of 2016, early 2017 from NIH. It's over 100,000 images and with labels that are uh, derived through NLP, on chest X-ray reports that are written for those images. So let me give a, a, a term definition right at here. I call these labels uh, silver labels. So silver labels are labels that derive for images, not by an expert looking directly at an image and labeling it, but 
by automatic analysis of a report that is already written and it's in your archive along with the image. So you run an automatic uh, NLP model to extract the labels from it, which is good, but not perfect. So there is some level of error here. And there's been a lot of studies on the quality of these. And that first data set that came out of NIH, the year after there was a study on the quality of labels and the labels were not that great actually. So there was some correction to the labels that were made at, at later. Uh, but it was the first effort. We never had 100,000 images of any kind in medical imaging until that point. And then in, uh, the, a, a little later, we had two more, uh, which were actually larger. Chexpert is from Stanford. It's an effort at Stanford. And um, I think in the order of 300,000, but one of the biggest advantages of it is that it also has full resolution images. And it also has labels for, I think, 14 diseases. Um, so the, the, one other problem with these public data sets is that the labeling is not comprehensive, meaning that you, you don't have a full catalog of all findings that could be in a chest x-ray image. They're labeled for a certain number of labels, uh, 14, for example, in chest Shakespeare. And then we have MIMIC um, CXR database, which actually made available the reports and the images, about half a million. This one is out of a collaboration in Boston. Um, Harvard and MIT, and uh, the, this one, you can actually do your own NLP to extract labels. And a lot of the work that we did was use this because it allowed us to like do more labels and more extract more labels, not limit us to the small number of labels that are typically given. So this three data sets and there are a few more, some of them semi-public or uh, that you, there are some strings attached, but these three are essentially for academic research purposes public, and it's more than a million images combined. So that is why you had this really large um, interest in chest X-rays, um, and a lot of the papers that were written in method development for AI in healthcare and imaging were focused on chest X-rays. Um, none of those three papers on the right are from me or my group, uh, but uh, we, uh, the two on the left at the bottom uh, are from um, efforts that I was part of. So these are extracts. These are kind of like supplementary data sets that we and others developed to even to make even better those data sets. Uh, Mimic data set was the target. Uh, for both of these. One of them, the one on the uh, left from scientific data, I think 2021 we wrote. This was an interesting data set where we took a number of these images, a small number because uh, it's a costly process. And we recruited one of the clinicians that was part of that project to wear a device that would track their eye while they were reading chest X-ray images and dictate the findings at the same time as they were looking at the image. So they do essentially the, what they do in clinic, but while their eye is being tracked and their words are being uh, recorded and the dictation is being coordinated with the uh, coordinates of the, uh, uh, with the eye. So we know when the clinician talked about pneumonia, what part of the image they were looking at. So it's a way of essentially uh, helping the network with attention. So if you have an attention mechanism in your network, you can use that to amplify the outcome. And this spirit, uh, line of research, which has become also a workshop at NeurIPS, and every year we have like 30 something papers using this data to develop more advanced AI models for um, automatic read of chest X-ray images. Chest imaging and the other one is a, another data set that was a product, like a byproduct of MIMIC. And uh, I was uh, part of that team we developed. And this um, adds to the MIMIC data set a few dimensions. One is we've ran automatic segmentation of chest X-ray images and uh, mapped the labels to the location on each image. So now in this data set, you not only have global labels for chest X-ray images, but for 14 different anatomical locations in the image, places like right lower lobe of the lung, those are, that's an example of one of those 14 locations, you know if there is opacity or disease in that specific location. So that allows training of the neural networks with localized labels, which actually helps a lot. So these are kind of like efforts 
with data and they allowed a huge amount of progress in the area of chest X-ray imaging. Um, before uh, I go into full reporting on chest X-ray images, I wanna talk a little bit about like some early work that we did. When these chest X-ray images came out, um, the first notion before we get to the point of like, let's do the whole image read with automatically with chest X-ray, was what can we do to kind of like help the, um, uh, the, the community and the, reduce the workload of radiologists short of doing their, uh, the whole kind of like image report. And I think actually in retrospect, that was probably the best way to do it. Um, some of the, uh, we'll talk a little bit about full reporting, but I think this early application was probably a more reasonable use of AI. Here, the application was normalcy detection. Um, chest X-ray is the most common radiology uh, modality out there. So there's like billions of these taken and um, they are not just taken when somebody is sick. They're taken for a screening purposes. They're taken even for regulatory purposes. For example, anybody that wants to work at a hospital has to take one. Anybody that has immigration has to take one. And obviously anybody that has a, like a bad cough or all sorts of impressions has to take one. And all of these had to be read, but because they are taken in a screening process, 90% of them are clean. Most people are healthy. So they, 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 but they still have to be read by a radiologist. And it doesn't matter if you are in a developing country or in North America, your image has to be read. So what if we have an AI model that can detect the normal ones? And, this is a question about essentially um, uh, operational point for your classifier. In this application, really the key is we don't necessarily want to have a very, very high rate of normalcy detection. As long as we can remove a percentage of normal images from the workload without introducing any or very close to any uh, false negatives, then we can have a useful application. So the key is that uh, set your AI, tune your AI to a point where you can take out a percentage of normals with extremely high uh, precision that these are normal and none of the disease cases are removed from this. So a, a model like that has to be um, uh, very ro robust and it, it needs real good benchmarking so you can convince people that it actually is doing that. And it also has to be comprehensive. So the abnormal class is fairly difficult to, to define and also the normal class. What exactly do you consider as normal and abnormal? For example, if there is a line or tubes placed correctly in the image, that's a finding that's an, in, the, in the patient, that, that line or tube appears in the image and it's a finding. But the, it, if it's placed correctly, that's a normal image from a clinical point of view. So do you define that as normal or abnormal? And what, Essentially, what we did was um, we created this uh, gold label data set. So we talked about uh, uh, silver label data set, which are automatically dri driven labels, like what we did is uh, the mimic data set. And we used that silver label data set for training. But for the validation, you need a gold labeled data set. And how do you get a gold label data set? So we, we took uh, 1,749 images randomly from Mimic and three radiologists. And there was no NLP involved. The three radiologists read these and um, we had three labels, normal or abnormal, and we gave them the same definition to work with. Um, interestingly, even though we had three, ex and these were experienced radiologists, they were not residents. Uh, they agreed, all three of them, on the labels for 1,271. So for the rest of them, about 400 something, there were, there was at least one radiologist that did not agree with the other two. So that's in itself is an interesting fact. But um, we put those 400 something in abnormal, because if there is any indication that there is abnormality, even by one of these radiologists, we want that to be considered abnormal. Because remember, the point is that we don't want to miss any abnormals. 
And they, we trained a model. I'm not, uh, this talk, I'm going to avoid showing many network architectures because there's a lot of details in these things and I won't have time to get into it, but I'm putting the paper there at uh, IEEE um, uh, Biomedical Imaging Symposium 2020. And these were the ROC and precision recall curves. And um, hoping that most of us know how to read these at the top, essentially, um, the, the blue dot is where you start to see false negatives. So it's about one third, it's short of 40%. What that blue dot means is that our network was capable of um, detecting about one third of the normal images without introducing a single false negative, which was the goal. Remember, at least in this like data set, we were able to remove about a third of the images without introducing any false uh, negatives and putting anybody that was sick in the healthy pile. And that's a, that, that I think was a, a huge, uh, uh, um, uh, hugely beneficial system for, for radiologists and for the actual process of clinical care. So that's one, one of the early applications of AI. Now, recently, like the, the, essentially the state of the art in report production is now what people are looking at. And these are primarily driven by the recent uh, trend in AI that is generative. So this, I think, is a 2022 paper. I might be wrong, but I think the one on the right is a sample. I, I, there, is, there are quite a few of these. This is from a model called mesh transformers with, uh, with memory uh, that uh, is invented in the realm of computer vision for captioning of images, non-medical images. These captioning uh, 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 methods were primarily developed in consumer AI for captioning your uh, um, pictures from your vacation. So there are large data sets of pictures with captions that people have written on Facebook and Instagram, and you can, people have scraped these bit large data sets. Now you given an image, um, essentially you wanna have a caption for it and make it as close as possible for the, uh, for the training data to the reference uh, captions. Same architectures were very quickly adopted for medical image captioning or report generation. Um, so these are primarily on the basis of a transformer-based encoder. So this on the right, I picked this from that paper itself, but it, because it's a good uh, high-level uh, uh, explanation of how this works. So you have an image encoder, um, a dense um, transformer-based representation of the image, and then you have a text decoder, which is a sequence generating network, and you train it um, to get essentially a report out that is close to the reference report. Now, the multiple of these come out in CVPR 2023. I reviewed five of these myself as a reviewer. Five different versions of these came to me to review this spring. So, um, and CVPR is not even a medical a medical com conference, but I'm just telling you the huge interest in this. But almost all of them have the some some issues. On the left, I have uh, this paper from uh, colleagues, I think at the Stanford that are looking at the problems with the way we are uh, evaluating these, uh, these models. And um, to kind of uh, uh, flesh that out, when you are looking at a medical imaging application, the number one requirement is accuracy of labels. And this doesn't necessarily have that. If you can, you can see that even though the generated report reads very well as an English bit of writing, it reads very well. But there are things in the first one that are not mentioned in the second one. There are things in the second one that are not mentioned in the first one. And more importantly, there's at least one clear, obvious factual error. When you say the left side plural infusion has increased in size and the, the original says essentially says there's no plural infusion. So that's effusion. So that's the kind of thing that you have to deal with. You see the same thing with BARD and chat GPT and things like that, but here the stakes are very high. So um, most of, if you look at this, and this one is from one of our own papers in the report generation. So I can kind of like um, say the, uh, the, the fault without kind of like feeling bad about uh, criticizing other people's work. This, uh, this I'm, I'm not going to go into the details of how we generated the reports, but you can see there are several 
methods uh, that we have listed there. And the last one was our methodology. All of these are essentially methods for generating reports or captions for images. And then you have these columns. Each one of them is a metric, like blue, one, two, three, four, and meteor and root. What are these things? These things are metrics that were invented in NLP for evaluating quality of translation. So if you have a translate from French to English and you want to see how good your translation is, you calculate this metric. Because we borrowed all the tools from consumer uh, AI, we also borrowed the metrics and we started essentially reporting these numbers to say that our network is good. But in reality, if you have a lot of words that are in common and a general sense of similarity, you get a high blue um, uh, a score, but you're not really testing the factual accuracy of your report. So um, one approach that we have tried to kind of like address this problem, and I think in this video, I'm going to uh, show it, was to, uh, instead of writing a full English report, this is an app essentially that we developed, and but the main thing is on the right where you have a categorized and a, where you have a categorized and um, a, a structured report as opposed to a paragraph in English. At the time, I advocated for this because I thought, like, what, like, really, like, probably the main problem with chess X the reports as written by radiologists is that they are very hard to read. And why do we have to, like, repeat exactly the structure that is the norm? Maybe we take the headers of what they talk about and we try to organize it and structure it. One advantage of that is that essentially each component of this, because it's discrete, can be evaluated and validated individually. You can look at each one of these that derives from a label and see how well you're, uh, you're doing that. So that's kind of like um, makes it a little easier to evaluate an AI system. And that's why I, I'm going to use this study that uh, um, is uh, the, the basis behind this work to show um, an example of an actual comparison of AI with an entry-level radiologist. So this was a 2020 work, also late 2020 work uh, went online and some revisions afterwards, but uh, the original work was 2020. Um, I put the network here, but we are not gonna talk about it. This was a network that was, this, uh, actually it's not transformer based because it's supervised, fully supervised and it uses silver labels derived from about half a million images in Mimic data set, and uh, about six months of work went into work uh, to this to to develop this model. Uh, the overall lead of the project was Dr. Tanvir Sadam Mahmood, who uh, was an IBM fellow at IBM Research, and I was in charge of like the AI part of it, the model development. There was a lot of work in uh, label development, and I want to show this table. So these are not the the kind of like fourteen or a small number of labels that you get from. Uh, you get in some of these um, uh, public data sets. We actually developed an in-house labeling machine and we had 72 different findings and we categorized them into anatomical, which is essentially disease and uh, abnormalities, uh, devices that you see in um, X-ray images, technical issues. One of the things that clinicians comment on when they look at the chest X-ray is technical quality of the image. And some of, sometimes that means the image has to be discounted or repeated. And then lines and tubes, the placement of lines and tubes and how they are correct or incorrect is another set of findings. So this table, which is directly from that paper, um, uh, lists uh, the number of samples in the data set from each finding and the area under ROC care, which we gained in our AI model. So uh, this was an effort towards kind of like making a comprehensive model. And then, um, then if to study that question of whether um, AI is kind of good enough, uh, we designed a study. The study was to try to compare um, chest X-ray AI model that we developed with the performance of uh, three-year re uh, trained residents. Why did we do that? One of the reasons was because we wanted, an, uh, uh, essentially we wanted a higher level arbiter, um, a gold standard. 
So we had three trained expert radiologists that took a, a smaller data set of about 2,000. Remember, we trained this on about half a million images, but which is the silver data set. But this a specific a study of validation was done on about 2,000 images, exactly 1,998. Um, uh, and these, these were gold labeled. Three radiologists looked at each image and we got consensus, meaning that we had conference calls where if there was an image that was disagreement, they discussed it. So we, there's a huge effort in terms of like getting, uh, building even an image data set of 2000 images of that kind of like gold standard. And then essentially what we did was that we took the AI model, we tested it on these 1998 images. And we also have the five, um, um, third year residents, finished third year residents um, from different institutions, Stanford and other places that uh, also read the same images. And they were essentially scored both AI and this uh, group of students or residents against uh, the gold standard of the consensus of two radiologists. And the table here is showing for multiple metrics how the comparison went. So the residents in terms of uh, predictive, uh, positive predictive value were uh, clearly uh, less, essentially performance was lower for uh, residents compared to the AI, 73 to 68%. Sensitivity was essentially a tie. Um, essentially they were the same, p-value is not significant. A specificity was also a bit of a, a, a small uh, advantage for AI. I would call that a, a pretty much a tie, a little bit. AI has an edge, but it's close to a tie. On the right, you see the ROC curves and the ROC curve for the um, for six of the findings in this data set, the six most, remember there was 72 and there's not enough room to go over all of them, but for the six, that were the most common findings, you see the performance of the resident, the average performance of the resident, and that's that uh, uh, blue, light blue square. If it's above the ROC curve, that means the residents essentially did better. If it's below, it means uh, they did uh, poorer. And if, the, if it's on, it's pretty much a tie. And you can see for central intravascular line detection and consolidation, the radiologist residents were clearly better. In the other ones, it's either it's high or AI has a slight edge. So again, on the basis of ROC also, I would say um, close to a tie. So the, what came out of this study, and we haven't been able, and I haven't seen a similar one for um, comparison with more experienced radiologists, maybe the more advanced networks in the last two years can get better results. I'm pretty sure they can. The problem is, how do you validate it? How do you, if you comparing with experienced radiologists, who is the arbiter? And that's kind of like one of the um, problems with answering that first question that I posed at the beginning. Can AI um, essentially uh, read your chest x-ray? The answer is maybe, but um, we have so far established at least that in the context of comparing to a trainee third year radio. I also want to say, I, I'm gonna take another couple of minutes and then I'll stop to um, see if there are questions before we move on to the next part and I can drop the next part. So um, I wanna emphasize that uh, there are challenges in even reading chest X-ray that, uh, that we are doing is still very poorly on is AI. One of the things that radiologists look at is change detection. So a lot of times you screen a patient over time. They come in with pneumonia, and then the next week they come back and you have to compare and see if it's better, worse, or unchanged. And that's very commonly a line on chest X-ray reports that you see. We are really bad at that. We are very bad at AI is currently very, uh, the accuracies are very low. It's a three-way classification. We have a paper in Mikai 2022 and another one in 2023 with my student at McMaster, Ann Wang, who essentially looked at a subset of images from the image genome data set that we developed ourselves at IBM Research. We looked at the problem of given two images, use a Siamese network to say if two images from the same patient over two timestamps to say if the condition in one image is improved, worsened, or unchanged in the second one, which is taken a week later. 
And the 2023 solution is a transformer-based uh, model, hierarchical vision transformer model, which is a state of the art. And the performance is, you can see here, um, the very last row, sorry for the busy slide, but the numbers at the very, very last, uh, the, the, the first table is like the data that we have from nine different diseases with this, um, with the change uh, labels. And uh, the second table is showing you the actual performances per each one of these that we got. And the last row is our 2023 Mikai paper that was just accepted. And the performance, average performance is 49%. You will not get, an, a, get a paper accepted in an AI conference with 50% accuracy these days, right? But this essentially, but we did get that twice in a row with accuracy is around 50% because we really beat the state of the art. 50% is better than the state of the art. So this, I'm, I'm emphasizing the fact that there are challenges in this area that are clearly still remaining. And we are, we, to be factually correct, we really need to do better on some of these specific problems of, uh, uh, um, of chest sex or read. And maybe we have to, uh, maybe we have to be, um, develop a specific and targeted models for this. And this was one of those efforts. Uh, we promised that 35, 40 minutes I'll stop. Um, so I want to open the floor for discussion. And there is another topic here about semi-supervised learning on chest X-ray images, but we can we can skip that. Um, the, the, uh, and I, I would uh, summarize the talk so far by saying that, uh, can we have AI read the chest X-ray images for us and write reports? The answer is technically, yes, we can get a report out of AI that reads like a chest X-ray image, but factual accuracy is still something that we are attempting to get at. And certain tasks uh, for radiologists, which are more cognitively uh, advanced, like looking at comparison of fine grain changes over time are still a big challenge for, uh, for, for AI. Um, I stop here, John. If there are if there are questions or discussions uh, or uh, anybody wants to add to what I said, I'm sure in the community we have experts that know better than, than I do. So uh, please um, chime in. Great, thanks, Mehdi. Um, so I'll, uh, we'll open it up to questions. Isaac. Hi, hey, Mehdi. Thank you so much. Thanks, John. Um, Maddie, my question starts probably at the quality of the data. I think you've addressed some of that stuff here, whether you start with the, uh, when you when you talked about access to the entire internet and its ability to, and the ability of AI to draw data from the internet, given the fact that the internet itself is, might be littered with low quality data. But maybe even more importantly, when you're asking a specific question like yours and chest x-rays and the quality of the x-rays, do you, so, the quality of the data is, that you start with is super important, but are you able to discover that the quality is low, medium, high, whatever it is, before you start investing time in in AI the, of AI in that with that data? Like, do you have to wait for results to go back and say, "Oh, my results aren't too good because the data I started with is not good," or do you or do you study the data? to start off with and say, this is no good, it needs to be clean. And whatever clean means, I'm not, I'm not even sure what that means. Thanks for the question. Um, so first of all, just for clarity, I wanna make sure that is, this point is clear. My refer, reference to data off the internet was for consumer AI. We rarely have the luxury of pulling data from internet in health AI, medical images. Just to, I, I know that, that that is probably understood, but I want to emphasize. So all the data sets on the chest X-ray that I discussed are organized by an institution. They are kind of like curated. So there is some, uh, some level of uh, quality control for, for those. But um, we also have metrics, especially because my domain is mostly, mainly imaging. There are metrics. For example, the number one metric is just resolution. What is the size of your image, right? So that's that's the first one. The second one, actually, for images again, the answer is sometimes uh, more complicated. For example, there are older data sets of chest X-ray which are scanned. They are not digital. They are scanned from film, and a scan can have low quality. Some of them are taken from an archive and scanned without taking into account that some of the chest X-ray images are ruled out. 
right? Because when you scan the image, you don't really get all the metadata that comes with it in a digital system. So they end up in the image. So there are data sets, even in the NIH data set, there were examples of this. So one of the things we did actually was we developed an we developed a quality control model for AI itself. So, uh, and I think for a healthcare system, it might pay to do that, especially if you are pulling data from sources that are not 100% clear to you, or if you are uh, pulling data from digital and non-digital scanned images and combining them, having an AI model, a model that essentially given a data, an image, would tell you if this is a good quality image or a bad quality image. And if you really are lucky, you can, it, it can also diagnose the problem. For example, in, in case of chest X-ray, the image can be overexposed, underexposed, the field of view might be incomplete. These are the kinds of things that happen. And radiologists rule out a bunch of images on the basis of these problems. So if you have a net, so just to summarize my long response, some metrics are easy to calculate, things like performance, so, sorry, things like resolution. Others are, if you like, for example, if you have, if you look at the histogram of a chest X-ray image, you expect a certain histogram. And if it's like very concentrated at high density or low density, you know image is overexposed or underexposed. And then the third one would be a smarter ways of just look at, just develop a model. If you, you will have a bunch of images that are good and bad and are labeled and train a network and rule them out. In the overall area of consumer AI, if that's what you mean, getting the data from off the internet, that is a major problem for all these companies that are working on. I'm not an expert on it, so I don't, uh, I don't want to talk about it as an expert, but I would say that a lot of the inaccuracies, factual inaccuracies that you see in the responses from language models come from the fact that the data is mostly uncurated and uh, that that like you don't know what is getting into it and that's why some of these have factual errors and we are, they're dealing with it hopefully so i answered something relevant to what your question was. absolutely thank you great uh merrick uh, hi, Mehdi. Th thanks very much for uh, for this discussion. Um, I'm an infectious disease doc, but I also teach in health research methodology. In fact, this year, the, for the first time in our diagnostics course, I, I mentioned AI. I've in intentionally not mentioned it for the first, last 10 years because it's really ha hasn't really felt like it was ready for kind of prime time in a clinical research setting. You, you, you noted that you want to particularly look at it for ruling for, for negatives, and I, I agree with that. We kind of use lab automation and microbiology to read the negative plates and to auto result those, and then a much smaller number are actually worked up by our lab technicians. But I wonder if you could even take it back a step before that. You're using, you know, excellent quality quality uh, academic institution x-rays, but out in the periphery, out in the community, the biggest problem would simply be the lab, the, the x-ray techs who take them aren't as well trained. They may not recognize whether they're hundred percent positioned correctly, exposed correctly. You know, do you think this system would be fast enough that it would give good give feedback to simply say that there's a good quality image because you know you take an x-ray patient goes home if they're not an inpatient you, you the radiologist looks at it and says it's rotated it's underexposed and again in a setting like yours you've probably got better quality than you'd necessarily get in all the uh, peripheral sites so i do wonder whether that kind of role of quality control could be one of the first practical applications and i do like the you know, your suggestion that perhaps quickly identifying the negatives. And then the third interrelated one would be something that could quickly identify the need for further images. Um, although you can't always rapidly get a CAT scan, but if the person while they're there, the x-ray was read and said, you know, there's a questionable mass in this, you know, you're going to need a CT rather than sending them home if you had a radiologist quickly review that. So I do think there are what I would call more triage purposes and kind of management kind of decision making processes where this could already play a role. Thank you, Marek. Um, I really am uh, impressed by your observation because uh, I have to disclose that part of this work was done and I said at the beginning at IBM Research when IBM created this Watson Health Unit, which unfortunately in 2020 they spun it off for business reasons. So we don't really have that. Uh, it, it wasn't necessarily from the business point of view, didn't come to fruition, but we did the research part of it. 
Uh, when we were discussing the early applications of AI, this was exactly discussed. So one of the first models that my team trained was exactly this. And this, the, the, this, the, the, the selling point was exactly what you said. So if you have a radiologist, uh, some, some patients had to be rolled to the, um, to the radiology unit for a chest X-ray. Others couldn't even move. You had to bring a C arm to them. And then you would take a chest x-ray, the radiologist that is going to read this is reading in, sitting in some other building or some other side of the uh, hospital. And by the time they rule out the image because it's underexposed or overexposed or half done, the CR is back in radiology or the patient is back to their hospital or home, right? So um, that was kind of like the first thing that we discussed and we developed a model. The, the model was, um, uh, actually there is a patent on it. One of these 20 patents that John mentioned is uh, the, the patent on quality control for uh, chest X-ray images. And I think there were like, actually I have to go back and look at, there was a number of possible technical issues rotation, underexposure, overexposure, incomplete field of view. These are the ones I remember, there were more. That essentially given a chest x-ray image on the spot, and it was a fairly light model. It wasn't a huge model, so it could e easily be run on the spot, on the machine and run. I, one, one aspect of um, radiology AI and healthcare AI in general is the medium to deliver the product. And in this case, we had a model that worked, but the owners or the, the, the operators of chest X-ray images and the PAC systems in the hospital, that was not us, right? So in order to actually Im implement what you're suggesting, it's not just about having a model that does the job, but it also has to be implemented and be on the monitor for the chest ray, for the, sorry, X-ray uh, technologies to see right away and repeat it, right? So, it's 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 AI to solve the problem, but also technology issues to kind of deliver at the right point and right spot. And I think that second part, at least in the in the organization I was part of, we didn't get to that to come to fruition. But the the, the model is there, and the, there is a patent on it even. So, but I, I agree with you hundred percent that that's that's some, something that is like a low hanging fruit that can be solved. That that there is an AI solution for it. Thank you. I also wanted to quickly mention your, your solution of having three radiologists read in triplicate was actually part of the first randomized trial in modern history, which was Sir, Sir Austin Bradford Hill and tuberculosis. And he recognized that the reading of x-rays was very poor. So he yeah. had three radiologists read it and resolve by consensus. That was their endpoint in terms of whether streptomycin worked for tuberculosis. I don't, re I don't recall this, but I assume uh, Tanvir, our uh, overall lead at IBM, probably had seen that. So I, I assume that came out of somewhere. <laughs> so this could have been, this could have been, I don't remember it exactly, but that could have been the historical background for it. But you, you realize that the cost of doing something like that in, in the, the problem is ex these medical imaging is that you have so many modalities, so many questions that you can ask. For each one of them building something like this is a huge cost, even for, and uh, for like a multinational corporation, it was a huge cost. And in academia, it's really prohibitive pretty much. So that's kind of like, that's, that's one of the problems for making sure that you build AI that works, but also provably and reliably. Great, anybody else? Uh, if not, I'm gonna ask a question, a quick one. So it, it, it follows the same line of thought um, of the, the discussion that just ended about this idea of uncertainty, right? So you have, you know, three clinicians coming to two different conclusions. Yeah. Uh, because of that, you have some uncertainty around some prediction, right? Yeah. So I'm curious, given that there's often noise in the data and every prediction by some model is gonna have a little bit of error around it. How do you incorporate uncertainty in your model predictions in the case of, you know, you know, even like a simple binary classifier, normal, not normal? That's a very good question. And um, one of the problems with the more advanced AI models of today is that that question is becoming harder to achieve. That, that the, the, like In older models, a smaller neural network 
there was a Bayesian framework that you could implement and make your model essentially a statistic. Like the, the output of your model would have been a scaled probability for the class, right? So when you get a class likelihood out of a network, that's not necessarily probability in the sense that we understand in a statistics, a number is scale between zero and one. And like point four is exactly twice as likely as point two. That's not what these things are. And because they are not, so you can't really kind of like draw conclusions like this. There is a bad practice in AI, which we use to, to treat it that way, because there's not much else to, to do. Um, if you have a, a small enough network or a solution that is kind of manageable to convert it to a Bayesian formulation, then there are Bayesian neural networks that are out there and uh, working that you can actually formulate it and get an actual probability. And now you know that if it's 70% outcome, like if the if the layer, if you know that the neural network output gives you 0.7, you know, it's 70%, right? So you kick a number on it and you can run it a hundred times. Because we don't have that, what we do is that we run it many times. Like the, 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 uh, in the slide that you're looking at, all of those metrics have a predictive, sorry, it has a confidence interval. How did we get that? Essentially, you run it thousands of times, it's bootstrapping, and you get, you get the numbers out. And that, that's not the perfect solution. The perfect solution would be to get a, get, get a probabilistic model. And that has become increasingly difficult on more complicated models. The best, like the, the alternative is what we are doing here, which is bootstrapping and getting a confidence interval out of repeating it and changing the conditions a little bit. There is a systematic way of doing that also. There's something called dropout. So in each iteration of training your network, you drop a percentage of the nodes in your network. So essentially you introduce a little bit of nodes. So you get a perturbation of, the, uh, of your model. As a result, you get kind of a, um, a, range, of a range of outputs and you can kind of like uh, put a confidence interval on it. So there are tricks. None of them are perfect, to be honest, but we, we, we try to get like as, as, as close as possible to Bayesian framework as we can. Awesome. Thanks, Betty. Um, if there are, I'm just looking out for any questions. I don't see any more. So with that, um, thank you, Mehdi, for a really cool talk. Really, really interesting. Um, and, and, and thank you, everyone, uh, for showing up today. Uh, before I go, I just want to let you all know that in September, uh, we have Christian Vanderpool speaking. Um, and he's going to be talking about uh, machine learning diagnosis of liver cancer on MRIs. So another imaging based talk. So I look forward to seeing you all there. Um, so thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mehdi. Enjoy the rest of your day. I appreciate the uh, thoughtful questions. Thank you for the discussion.